But I will say, as I said, my son's come home from hospital. I'm in a, in a brand new house. If you stick around for the end, I'll tell you a funny story about what happened to me while I was in the hospital. Welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you can hear me. Hopefully, you can see me sing out in the chat line if you cannot. It's been a while since we had an office hours of the DBA variety. Uh, I had to cancel it for uh, in June, I think it was, because uh, my dog was ill, believe it or not. The dog had come back from an operation at the vet, and then I needed to cancel it I deferred it by a week, and then it turned out that that actually coincided with our database house party, and we didn't want to have a clash there. So I simply ended up deferring June's, and we thought we'd come into July. So thank you for attending. Thank you for your patience, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the show. I just I just uh, tweeted recently uh, that I'm in a different place today. Uh, normally, those who are familiar with my familiar backdrop at Office Hours, uh, I'm at a family Someone said they can hardly hear me. Okay, hold on, let me see if we can tweak the uh, mic. How's that? Is that a bit better? Sing out in the chat line if uh, that's better. Okay, cool, people can hear me. Thank you, thank you for letting me know. It's always good to have that. Part of the reason for that is uh, I'm running my own different laptop, different machine, different setup all tonight because I'm at a different place. Um, my son recently had a knee operation and he's now convalescing here at home, or not this home. Uh, he's, he's here because I'm at a family member's house, which is a single story building. I live in a uh, multi-story place and therefore having uh, him on crutches didn't work out. So I've, my family and I have moved here for the next couple of weeks, which unfortunately means in terms of ops hours means I've got computers on boxes and I've, I'm in this little cramped room, et cetera, but we, we'll do our best and we'll see if we can, we'll get through it all tonight. Okay, let me share my screen. Hopefully you can see the standard title slide and hopefully you can all hear me well. Um, sing out in the chat line if you can. Let me bring up the chat window just so I can see. So this is how you get in touch with me um, on YouTube um, if you need to. But getting in touch generally in any way, shape or form is easy with me. I'd uh, go to Linktree slash Connor and my blog, Twitter handle, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there. And uh, hopefully you'll reach out to me on Twitter in particular. Uh, it seems to be the best way to communicate nowadays in terms of quick fire communication. Of course, there may be plenty of tweets you'll see from me that um, obviously probably weren't from me because of the way Twitter got hacked this morning. I, I shouldn't make light of that. Um, my, my, I have to admit, my, um, my heart goes out to the uh, people um, who are look after in the back rooms at Twitter. Uh, getting hacked as a company, there is no worse and most stressful feeling. So uh, shout out to the people at engineering at Twitter. I'm sure you've had a terrible day and hopefully things will work out. Not on commission. As I always say, no need to adjust your set. All the slides will be down at the bottom left, the content, and that way when we make this into a YouTube video, you'll be able to see myself at the top right. A few bits and pieces to get us going. I know there's been a lot of virtual content, uh, a lot of virtual content of late. Uh, we've had the database house party, there's OG Yatra, which is, I was part of fantastic event, two weeks of solid content, speakers all around the world. And it's very easy to get burned out. But one thing I would advise, and hopefully uh, you take this on board, even with all the office hours sessions we've been having. And, and I will say that office hours, I, I'm, I'm stressing, we were the pioneers of virtual events. Uh, we've been doing this for two and a half years now, long before uh, the rigors of the world uh, intervened. But I know it's easy to get burnt out, but one of the things we do with office hours, we chop up our, in our videos into smaller segments. So I, I'm always a fan of if you stay for the whole hour, that's awesome. If you don't stay for the whole hour, um, I love the fact that we can then produce little snippets of highlights on YouTube for you to watch afterwards. Uh, I have I take no offense when people have to leave um, partway through an office hour session. But I will say, as I said, my son's come home from hospital. I'm in a, in a brand new house. If you stick around for the end, I'll tell you a funny story about what happened to me while I was in the hospital uh, with my son. But for the time being, let's move on. But it is proof that virtual can work 
as I said, the Yatra event, um, I normally this time of year, I'd be in India traveling around through 10 or 11 cities, obviously not happening this year, but the Yatra event, which has been virtual, has been an astounding success. Several hundred attendees every single day. All the feedback I'm getting has just been the attendees have loved it, the speakers have loved it. And um, it's just a real good launch pad, hopefully, for lots of speakers to actually visit India in, in years to come. Hopefully continuing on that vein, uh, coming up, I think, in August is the Latin America equivalent of the OG Yatra Tour. Uh, multiple cities, obviously virtual, I'll be involved in that. And obviously for our Spanish speaking audience, uh, this is a critical event, so please support that. But here is something that I'm happy to announce, pretty much just came out today, something very huge. You will have seen that Open World and Code One uh, obviously will not be physical events this year. We're replacing it with this thing called the Developer Live series. And the first one event will be a database focused Developer Live series. You can register now for that at developeroracle.com developer-live slash database. It's about as fast as I can say that. But yeah, there'll be a full program of database focused events. Then there's a full program of stuff, I think Java, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a multiple week series of events. Uh, the first one being database, it's coming up in mid August. And yeah, that's your replacement effectively for code one. So please get involved in that. That'll be a huge fun event. Public service announcement, as, as I've been saying the last few months, uh, in March when I first put up, that was what the, uh, the John Hopkins COVID map looks like. And now it looks something like this, uh, a lot more red dots. And as I always say, if we're gonna have community events like this, whether it's OG Yatra, whether it's Latin America tour, whether it's just office hours, whether it's just Twitter and banter and chat, uh, obviously we need a community. Uh, if we're gonna have a user community, we need users. So please stay safe, follow your local guidelines. Uh, when one day we do get to meet face-to-face -face again, I would hate for our numbers to be reduced in any way due to the current pandemic. So if there's any way that we can help out, uh, please uh, reach out to us and, and uh, we'll do our best. This session, I put maybe, because we deferred last month's session, there's a bucket load of stuff that's come in. CPU management for pluggables, triggers and locking, better triggers, queries using undo, standby redo logs, partial data redaction, sequences broken on insert all, and recursive calls. Will we get to all of it? I somehow have my doubts. I should have, uh, yeah, it'd be cool to have a two hour office hour session, but then you'd get all very bored. So let's jump straight into it with the multi-tenant one first. As we've said before, in 19C, you get three pluggables for free. You don't have to have a multi-tenant license anymore. And way back in 12.2, we introduced resource control for pluggable databases. And there's a very good reason we did this. Most people I know have somewhere in their company what I would call their ideal database. It's a thing of beauty. They're, they're so pleased with it because it actually is the, the easiest thing for them to manage. It's a beautiful written, it's got SQL wrapped in a peel SQL layer, uses really good connection pooling, and it has this beautiful consistent performance profile. If we're lucky enough, all of our databases in our companies are like this, but generally in reality, uh, it's rare. But sometimes, yeah, we get lucky, whether it's a packaged app or whether we built it ourselves, it is just a beautiful example of an Oracle application. Unfortunately, they're often in the minority. Often in the same data center, we'll have another Oracle database. The code is just spaghetti and junk, and it's the thing that gets you out of bed two or three times a week, getting paged or mobile phone going off and the performance spikes and things are crashing. It's just a nightmare. And it was a bit of a tough sell uh, when 12.2 came out for us to say, you know, we'd like you to take these two things and just run them on the same server on the same container database as two pluggables. And, and most people rightly said to us, you know, I don't think so, because what happens is, the one on the right, which consumes all the resource, just starts to swallow up the really good, the one good example database I've got. And it's just getting clobbered by this other one, which is taking all the memory, all the CPU, all the IO bandwidth, et cetera. It was, I don't think so, I'm not that keen. Now in 12.2, we 
did a lot of work to address this right off the bat, which was you could set CPU count at the pluggable level to do inst the equivalent of instance caging at the pluggable level, and you could set MAPS IOPS. And it's been a long time since I did this demo, so I thought I'd just show you quickly what an example of that. I'm going to create a table called T percent free 99, which means one row per block. And then I'm going to put an index on it. Now you can see I've done order by DBMS random value. What that does is the index is ordered, but the data is scattered. So if I do a series of symbol primary key lookups, it's actually the worst kind of IO I could do on an Oracle database because the data is so widely scattered. It's got a terrible clustering factor. So what's going to happen is as I walk through the index, I'll be bouncing around all these single blocks because there's only one row per block in the database. If I run it in a pluggable database with no resource controls turned on and just burn away, what am I doing there? I'm doing about, I think about 80,000. It's a copy of DBA objects, about, about 80,000 or so single block random IOs. It took about 15 seconds. If I connect to another pluggable, with the exact same data structure set up, as you'd expect, it also takes 15 seconds. Both those things are simply smashing the IO subsystem as hard as possible. If one of them takes 15 seconds and I ran both of them together, obviously one would suffer. They can't both get it done in 15 seconds. That's the fastest IO bandwidth I have. If I wanna control that, this is the kind of thing I've been able to do from 12 to onwards. I could actually set maps IOPS equals 300 in one of the pluggables. Now, when I run the exact same demo again, it doesn't take 15 seconds. It takes four minutes. And that's because I set the max IOPS incredibly low. 300 IOs per second is terrible. That's almost tape speed. And you can see when you look at these session wait events, it's actually a uh, resource manager that's coming in and doing that work there. You can see resource manager IO rate limiting comes on. So out of our four minutes over at the right, you can see 215 seconds of that was actually resource manager going, whoa, you've exceeded your 300 limit, you need to wait for a while. So resource throttling is very good. And that's been there since 12.2, but that's not the entire story. If you've gone out and bought a server, this is one of those common things that you have to deal with in servers. You have an expected usage, which might be what you have in the arrow you can see there. We're expecting to use maybe half the machine, but what if we peak from time to time at 100%? Then what happens, of course, is we have to keep that much headroom floating around. Now that's fine for a machine where you're running a single database and it has access to the entire infrastructure. But part of the promise of what we've done with pluggables is saying you can run lots of different databases that used to be on separate servers and consolidate them as one on the single machine. That makes things a bit tricky because here I have a few pluggables and the graphic here is meant to show you what their typical CPU usage would be, which is the size of the actual pluggable database. And the box surrounding it is their peak usage. So this one here, pluggable sits at about 60% and occasionally jumps up another 40%. I might have another pluggable that uses on average less CPU, but its peaks are much, much higher. And I might have another pluggable which has, only uses a tiny bit of CPU, but when it does peak, it absolutely goes berserk. Now, when you're consolidating these things onto a single server, it's a bit hard to decide how you're going to carve up the resources. If I carve up the CPUs at their typical level, say four CPUs for the first one, three for the second, and one for the third one, then obviously when they need their spikes, they're going to be limited. They're not going to get their workload done. But if I set the limits above at what their peaks would be, six, eight, and 12, then I've probably oversubscribed the machine. And even if I haven't, what I'm now doing is the one that's allowed to get 12 at the far right, when he is using all 12 CPUs, he's probably gonna have a detrimental impact on the other two. They might not be able to get their six and eight CPUs. That's been an issue for pluggable databases on existing hardware. What we've done in 20C is, as well as having the existing CPU count parameter, which you can set at the pluggable level, which sets an absolute max on what they can get, you can also set a CPU min count now from 20C. What that means is a particular pluggable is guaranteed to get a certain amount of CPU resource. So even if a rogue pluggable 
you want to be able to let it you know, grow to, to handle peaks and troughs, it won't be allowed to grow to such a degree that it impacts the other pluggables below their min CPU count. It's a way now of setting both those max and min facilities to allow pluggables to expand and collapse amongst their CPU limits. And the cool thing is, it's not just like, well, if you've got eight cores, you have to set it to one through eight. If we zoom in and that text is very small, it says you can actually carve up the CPU min count down to, I think it's 0.1 of a CPU. So if you've ever used AIX and are familiar with the LPAR system where you could carve up a machine into segments of a CPU, this is a similar kind of facility. What you can now do is say, okay, this machine, this pluggable gets 2.7 worth of CPU. You're not assigning a physical CPU or core to a pluggable, you're actually saying this is your allowance. It's similar to, we introduced a thing called shares in resource manager, I think in 18C and maybe even 12. And what we found was it still was very complicated to use. And as pluggables got unplugged and plugged or where the workload changed, you had to go build new resource manager plans all the time. CPU count and CPU min count is a better way of allowing that flexibility for pluggables to go between low and upper bounds as the CPU they're allowed to have. Now, why am I talking about this if it's a 20C feature? Because it is coming to 19C as well. I think it'll be in 19.8, maybe 19.7 even. But yeah, so the facility that was built in 20C is being backported because it's a very, very cool piece of technology. Now, a word of warning on when we talk about features that were planned for release X and are backported to release X minus one, or things you might see in the database or in the documentation. 20C features do manage, because we do these annual releases and they're very rapid fire releases, can creep back into things. So for example, in the 19C documentation, we had this CPU min count. Now it is not there in 19C, it's coming. It's coming, I think, yeah, as I said, in 19.7 or 19.8. But this was in the documentation from the very start for 19C. And this is a key thing to be aware is once it's in the documentation, then you're allowed to use it. The existence of something in the database is not the same as the existence in the documentation. I can't stress that enough because if you just stumble across a feature in the database and it's not in the docs, it means you don't get supported for it. In particular, you can see in this doc was a 255.952.1. It says there were some parameters added in 19.3, but are not included in the reference and therefore are actually not supported for use. Allowed row ID column type, client statistics level, HTTP proxy, schedule or follow PDBTZ, SSL wallet. So it's important if they're not in the documentation, you're not really entitled to use them. Or if it's a documentation bug, then please get clarification from support first before you actually choose to go use those facilities. A lot of us like digging in there and seeing what new parameters and new features are there as releases come out. Uh, that's an entertaining pastime and good education for upcoming releases, but please make sure you actually check with support or check the docs first before using them. Okay, that's number one, 920. Yeah, it's gonna be a bad night in terms of covering, uh, <laughs> covering off all the stuff we want to talk about. This one's a cool one, triggers and locking. This was brought to our attention by a Ask Tom reader. Thank you to Jürgen. And um, it's something that I think you'll find very interesting. Can the triggers on a table impact the locks on that table? And this isn't some you know, um, stealth locking in terms of if I put in a trigger, a select for update or a delete from some other table, obviously that would have locks on other objects. We're just talking about very simple triggers that do no other operations besides uh, touching the, uh, the values of the table concerned. Can it impact the locking? And of course, I replied and asked, I'm saying, no, of course not. That's not true. That's not an issue. Triggers don't do that. And of course, I was wrong. Let's have a look at some examples as to where this gets quite interesting. So let's fire up a window. Just need to reach over and um, type away here on the... Uh, Laptop. I have a parent table and I have a child table and we can see on line three that we are referencing 
the child back to the parent with a standard foreign key. Put an index to avoid the foreign key locking because I don't want that to disturb our uh, results here. Put a sequence on so we can put primary keys into each one. And just to prove that it all works, we have a parent table, parent row, put a child row in, it refers back to the parent, commit them all. That's just stock standard referential integrity. All works fine. Let's see what happens when we do an uncommitted transaction. I update the parent table, set a row. There's no triggers or anything involved yet. I go look at the Vito locked object, join it back to all objects based on the object ID. And as you'd expect, the parent table has a share level lock. Simply saying, I can't go mess with this table structure while I have an uncommitted transaction on it. That's all fine. Let's now do your classic triggers for these kind of tables. I wanna make sure that if someone doesn't provide the primary key, I'll go get one. You can see there on line eight, new primary key equals parent seat dot next file. And as so many of our tables have, we have a created column and an updated column. And so you can see the trigger is before insert or update. Let me highlight that before insert or update. If we're inserting, assign a primary key. If we're updating, log the fact that we've changed the row. These are very common triggers. You see them everywhere. If you ever built something with the, our cool quick SQL product, you'll see that they, these are the kind of triggers that we build. And I'll do the exact same trigger on the child table because it's a, you know, we're using a consistent technique here. Populate a primary key. Apologies, that's my phone, which I should have turned off. We have a standard trigger on the child table. Same thing, populate a primary key populate an updated column if someone doesn't update. Let's now do an insert into parent, insert into child and the commit. So this isn't testing locking, we're just making sure our triggers both work. And now we go into our uncommitted transaction. This is identical as it was before, just updating the parent, firing the parent trigger and look what changes. Now, just by having a trigger on the parent table, it has no reference to the child table and we haven't done anything to the child table in terms of DML. We actually have locked both the parent and the child. That's interesting. Now the question is why? Let's roll that back and explore. Here's the why. This isn't SQL. You can see I've just put some vertical bars here at the start here. This is just showing the actual trigger code itself. It's this line here. Most of us know that if you manipulate the primary key of a parent table in a foreign key relationship, we have to do some level of locking on the child table. If you haven't got a foreign key index, it's the entire table. If you have, it's still effectively a lock on the child just at share mode. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on a second. I didn't do an, up I didn't do an insert on the parent table. I only did an update. How come this, which only fires on insert, created this problem. It's because a trigger is code. And so if I jump to, you know, what if the trigger was something like this? If inserting and two char state equals 12 and my function equals 10 and blah, blah, blah. The level of complexity in a trigger is obviously bound only to the complexity you could have in PL SQL code. It could be incredibly complex, yet, before the trigger fires, we need to decide on whether you're going to Let's try that again. Before the trigger fires, we need to decide on whether you're going to be manipulating the primary key because we need to be able to lock the child before this operation commences. So I don't know this for sure, but my hypothesis is, is all we do is we scan the trigger code and say, is there an assignment to the primary key? Effectively, is there a reference to the primary key on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. If there is, we're gonna assume it could happen during the trigger fire, and therefore we're gonna take these extra locks. And we can actually prove this. Even if I do something like if inserting and if the primary queue is null, which is never going to be true, we do it, we have the same locking problem. Do the update, no, no mention of insert, and yet we still have the lock on the child. Even if the trigger is tr so trivial like this, if it's false, it will never ever be true. And the only thing this trigger would ever do is that, but it'll never ever fire that code. Run my update. I still have the lock on both the parent and the child. 
we simply are looking at, is there a primary key reference on the parent on the left-hand side of, a, of an assignment statement? So how do we solve it? We actually solve it very, very easily. All we have to do is only make sure we reference that insert code for an insert trigger. We just have to split our trigger up into two parts. Our first trigger is only on before insert, then we do this. Now, we will lock the child as part of that, but that is a valid case because we are genuinely going to be manipulating the primary key here because we're only worried about inserts. And then we have a separate trigger for our updates. And then we have just the update part of the code, just reflecting this. Notice there's no mention anymore of the primary key in this update trigger. So now when I go update the parent, it does fire the update trigger, but we only lock the parent table because there was no reference in the trigger code to the primary key of the parent table. Let's drop that trigger and let's move on a little bit more. This is ideally what we should be doing. Now that we've broken the trigger up into insert and update, well, ideally, ditch the insert trigger because more often than not, all it's really doing is populating default columns. And with 12.2 and above, you can do default on null, which means even if someone tries to force a null in, we will overwrite them. So in this case, I've simply said, when P, the primary key is null, we're gonna use seek val as part of the declarative definition of the table. Same thing with the um, created column as well. And now inserts don't fire any triggers, which is great because that makes inserts rapidly fast. And as you can see, it all works as expected. That was the last row, the row number three. I still got a sequence value. I still got a created value. It all works. The only trigger now I have is an update trigger. And because the update trigger doesn't refer to the primary key, I'm not gonna have those additional locks. So my overarching model is always this. Less triggers is good because less code, less complexity, less risk of these things happening. Ideally, you should almost never ever need an insert trigger just to populate the defaults. Because less locks are good. Don't get me wrong, these aren't sort of absolutely massive blocking locks. They're lock mode three, which are share level locks, but there are certain things you can still actually get into some interesting deadlock situations with these locks. That's how we discovered this. Uh, we found some interesting locking issues on some of our internal apps running in Apex that had been built with Quick SQL because by default Quick SQL builds one trigger with insert or update. Quick SQL fixes are coming. The team is working on the Quick SQL fix to actually carve that up into two separate triggers. And as I said, if you can do away with the insert trigger altogether, that's obviously your best option. Okay, while I'm keeping on the time, oh dear. While we're on the topic of triggers, I wanna talk about what makes a good trigger. Now that seems a bit weird, like what, you know, a trigger is a trigger, surely. But triggers are one of those things that can become a noose around your neck. And I thought I'd show you that with a bit of a demo. I'm gonna change my date format to be quite long so we can see the minutes and seconds, just so we can actually detect some data as we're going along here. I've got a sequence called customer seek. It's gonna be used for primary key. And I've got a table called customers. And the, really this is just customer information. The column I want you to keep an eye on is the one called status. And by default, it's active. So we have the status of a customer. When we create a customer, by default, they'll be an active customer. And I'm gonna have a trigger, just a very similar trigger to what we would commonly have on a column, just to when you, when you simply change a row, we're gonna update the updated column with sysdate such that we know that that row has been changed. One of those common things we do with triggers. I'm gonna insert a value into customer and have a look. And it's all working as I expect. The sequence was populated. The status is active as a default. Created is populated, but updated is null because we haven't updated it yet. If I update that customer, then the updated column gets updated via the trigger. So everything's cool. We're, we're, our application is working as we'd expect. Okay, let me artificially put some extra data in now. I've got a thousand customers now inserted into the table. And what I'm going to do is now reflect some typical uh, activity that's happened as part of my application. I'm going to pick, uh, what have I got here? 10 customers, um, every third customer, and set their status to deleted. Let me, oh, that's run already. Set their status to being deleted. So if I look at the data now, 
This is a representation of the application after, say, a few months. Obviously, the time scales are much shorter for this demo. But you can see most of our customers are active, but there's an occasional customator that customator. Most of our customers are active, and there's the occasional customer that has been deleted. And because that was an update, we can see the updated column has been populated as well. At which point, we've suddenly realized that we have a bug in our application. The opposite of active is not deleted. It was meant to be active and inactive. Now, we should have had a check constraint on the table. Maybe that was forgotten. And therefore, we've actually got data corruption there. We shouldn't have had the word deleted in there. What do I have to do? Well, it's easy. I mean, you know, it's just a bug. We fix the code and then I just do a data patch to fix up the data, update the customer table, change the status to inactive where they were all deleted. Problem solved, right? But now we have an issue. Because we have a trigger on that table, notice the updated column got updated as well. This is generally something that we often don't want to occur because a data patch, often we don't want to change true data, like when the person really was made inactive. We've lost that information because the trigger fired and overwrote the previous value. And even if we did want to overwrite it, often we want to have that, at least that control. Do we want to actually change columns that the triggers would normally change when we're doing emergency data patches? So I'm going to roll back that change. This is often what we do. We say, well, we don't want the trigger to fire, so I'll disable the trigger, and then I'll run my update, and you can see I've fixed the data and the updated column hasn't been touched, and so I still have an accurate and true record of when the customer became inactive. Which is all well and good, except the moment I choose to disable a trigger, what have I got? I've got an outage, because I can't let my application run while that trigger is disabled. That's gonna introduce brand new data corruptions because the updated column won't be touched. The moment you have to disable a trigger to do some sort of maintenance, your application is out of commission. Let's roll back that change as well. So this is what I'm proposing. As the bare minimum, if you're gonna have any kind of triggers on a table, you need some mechanism to be able to selectively control if they fire or not. And this is a very simple facility. I'll, I'll put this on my blog or my GitHub. Uh, the bare minimum, what you could do. I've got a very simple package called trigger control. We've got a maintenance on flat setting, a maintenance off, and a function that tells us if the trigger is pseudo or logically enabled. And it's very easy to implement one of these things because all I have to do is create a associative array, which is indexed by varchar2. You can see there. All I'm going to put in there is the trigger name that I want to be enabled or disabled. And so to turn maintenance on, I pass in the trigger name and I simply populate that entry. The existence of that array entry is all I need to check. To turn it off, I simply delete it. And then to see if a trigger is enabled or logically enabled, I simply say, make sure that someone hasn't set the maintenance flag for this trigger then I can factor that into my trigger. And it's very easy to add. Rather than just having new updated equals sysdate, I'm gonna say, is this trigger enabled? I'm gonna look for the existence of this array entry. By default, the array is empty, so it won't be there. So this says, yes, the trigger is enabled, and then you can go ahead and do it. So now when it comes to doing my maintenance, I simply say, I'm in a maintenance mode in this session, so the trigger won't fire. I do my update, do my maintenance, and then I turn the maintenance off. And hopefully, yeah, we can see here that now I've fixed the data and I haven't interrupted that updated column. I haven't corrupted it even more. So if you're going to have triggers, you need to have a mechanism of being able to selectively at session level control whether they're on or off because data maintenance things happen. Accidents do happen. One of the things I've done in terms of making sure I don't make things worse for myself is often I'll add, for example, an expiry date. So it's the same package. But what happens now is the enable trigger says, if I've set the array, sorry, if the array is not set, then the trigger is enabled. If it is there, but it's within, say, an hour, I've set an expiry date, then yes, you're allowed to do data maintenance. But if more than an hour goes past, 
then I'm going to actually delete this entry. That's a way of saying, just in case someone turns on maintenance, does their fix and forgets to turn maintenance off, the worst that could happen is after an hour, we turn the maintenance off anyway. And you obviously can add and control as much as that as you like. Uh, you can have it, for example, just raise an error, which means we're not going to allow anything to happen until someone fixes up this flag. But that's just an example of the way you could keep extending this mechanism to make sure you have selective control over triggers, but also have a degree of insurance policy as well. So that's what I mean by better triggers. Another option is you can use addition-based redefinition. This is a really easy way, but it only makes sense if you've already activated additions. And that comes with its own set of restrictions and things to be aware of. But if you are a site that uses EBR, a real simple way of doing maintenance is you create a brand new addition, call it maintenance, go to that addition where everything exists from the previous edition, and then you can drop the trigger because that drop only applies in this edition, your brand new, the brand new edition that you're in. And then you simply run your maintenance and then you simply drop that temporary edition. And therefore the, the trigger stays active in the, the base edition. So it's a, a quick hack. If you're using editions, it's a really easy way of doing small changes to triggers and PLC SQL temporarily, simply by creating a new edition and then rolling it back effectively. Uh, but most people I know aren't running edition-based redefinition, but if you are, you get that benefit as well. Queries and undo. Now, that's a bit weird because why would a query need undo? And if you've come to my read consistency talks, you'll know why, but we're gonna fly through a little bit of revision. Our current production query is unstable. Normally it runs for 10 minutes, but sometimes it runs over hours. I want to know if the slow query was reading undo. Is there a dynamic view available for this information? Yes, there is, but not directly. So let's talk briefly about read consistency. And most of us are familiar with this. If session one starts a query at nine o'clock and that query is gonna run for several minutes, we don't stop session two coming along and changing the data as it was uh, for that running query. Other systems take read locks, we don't. The, the best thing about Oracle is readers don't block writers, writers don't block readers. So at five past nine, when session one stumbles across this same block that's already been modified by another session, it has to work out how to take that block back to nine o'clock to give you a read consistent view. And time obviously is system change number, and that's how we do it. We use the undo information based on the transactions undo. So the block that's SCN003 looks like the, the employee name of John. Session two comes along, they change it from John to Sue, which gets you a brand new SCN. And obviously, because it's a transaction, we record undo for that transaction because for all we know, that session may want to roll back. But we can see they've done a commit. Session one comes along, says, I need block 3217 as it was at 9 a.m. In this case, that's SCN 192. Block 234, block SCN 234 is way too new. So we take a copy in the buffer cache and then we go locate the other sessions undo and roll back that transaction. That brings it back to SCN 003 and an employee name of John. And that's good enough for us because SCN 003 is earlier than SCN 192. Obviously, I've done that pretty quickly, but we've spoken about read consistency on other sessions. But it could be a lot worse than that. That's like your best case scenario. What might happen is you might request block at 192 and find that the SCN is 1345. No problems. I'll roll that back, take a copy, roll it back. Oh, it's SCN 1195 now. Roll that one back. Oh, it's 1104. Oh, roll that one back. It's 768. Roll that back. It's 356. And so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And finally, we get it back to 185, which is good enough for our query for SCN at 192. Accessing one block might need to do a lot of undo because a lot of changes have occurred to it since you requested that query. And then we'd be done. How can we detect this? Let's do a little demo. So I'm gonna create a table as a copy of DBA objects, put an index on the object ID column, which is pretty much as primary key. And just to show the undo operations in action here, I'm gonna open a cursor here using that index 
querying all the rows in the table. It's about 70,000 rows, if memory serves. That cursor has been opened when the table has 70,000 rows. Now I'm going to delete all those rows in a single transaction. All those rows have been deleted, 72,000 of them, and committed. So they're gone. And in fact, let's see how we can see now if a query is using a lot of undo. In my session, you look, you have these stats and they all are suffixed with undo records applied. And these are where you want to be looking to see what's going on in terms of undo. They're all currently set to almost zero. Now I've set feedback to only, which means I am actually running a query, but I'm not showing the output. I'm printing out that ref cursor that I opened before I did the delete. So it needs to return to me these 72,000 rows. And it was doing index lookup. So it's literally getting each row at a time and every single row goes, ah, oh, your SCN is no good to me. I need to roll it back. So now I go look at my transaction tables and my data blocks and rollback changes. You can see I did 72,000 undos, 72,000 rows. Each one was, I encountered it, it's gone, it's been deleted. What it really is, is the SCN is too new. I need to roll back that row. So for 72,000 rows, 72,000 undos. That's example one of how you can detect when you had to do a lot of undo work. Now, it doesn't have to be some big table that has 70,000 rows and I deleted them all. It's not a matter of the volume of changes. It's more of a question of, sorry, I should say the, the volume of change. It's more a question of the frequency of transactions. They can be one and the same thing. Here's an equivalent table now. I've got that table and I create a brand new table, which is just one row. It's a one row from Jewel. I'll open up a ref cursor again on that one row. Now I'm just doing 25,000 transactions on that one row. So it doesn't have to be a big table, but I've now got 25,000 commits on that one row and the ref cursor was owned, opened up before any of those. So new session, my under records applied as zero. I print out just one row. That's all it was. And look at that 25,000 under records applied because I undid the first update. Oh, it's still too new. Undid the second update, undid the third. Had to undo 25,000 updates to get back to an SCN that was good enough for when that ref cursor was open. So it could be one transaction, huge amount of change. It could be lots of transactions, little amount of change in each or anything in between. It's really a question of how much work is it to get back to the SCN number I need to give a read consistent query. Just by way of interest is this is one of the reasons where sometimes a full table scan can actually give you a little bit of benefit. Here's my table T. Once again, it's the 72,000 rows of BBA objects. Open up a brand new cursor. There's no index on the table this time. Delete all the rows. We'll commit that transaction. Flush out the buffer cache so we can't cheat or anything. And now my stats start off to zero. It's a brand new session. I print out my ref cursor. It's just doing a full table scan. So 72,000 rows before they got deleted, I've still come back. But now I didn't do 72,000 undo records applied. I only did 1,400 undo records applied. And that's roughly the same size as the table. In this case, because I'm doing multi-block reads, I'm basically grabbing a block and undoing the block and therefore discovering that, ah, oh, that actually fixed all the subsequent rows in that block before I moved on to the next one. So sometimes uh, full table scans can actually get a bit better because they are less, uh, or they are more immune to being smashed by undo information. So as I said, it's not really the, the volume of the table that matters, it's the volume of change. You might change a small table lots of times, you might change a big table just once. Either way, that's when you're gonna start seeing the amount of undo having to be worked through to give you read consistent queries. And as we saw the stats you wanna be looking at are the undo records applied suffix stats. Obviously query duration is a big factor here. If I start a query, if a query runs, let me start again. If a query runs for four hours, there is a very high chance that it may stumble across a block that needs to be wound back four hours worth that might be one transaction, it could be a billion, but obviously the longer a query runs, the longer a query runs, 
the more work, the potential is there, especially if that's a high frequency time. If you're running a lot of stuff during that time, then the odds are queries running for that long will have to undo a lot of work. So be aware of that. It's important to realize that all those common things we used to talk about in the, in the days before our databases were 24 seven in terms of try run your batch in a quiet time, try run your long running queries outside your big batch updates, et cetera, are all still valid today. As DBAs, we're under more and more pressure because the systems are busy all the time, but these are things to be aware of. Uh, keep an eye on those undo records applied stats and see if you can shift things around to try avoid uh, getting punished on read consistency. How are we going for time? 9.48, yeah, I think we can get this one done. Standby redo logs. Why do we need standby redo logs? When we open our standby database, it's open with reset logs anyway, which creates brand new redo logs. So there seems to be little or no need to have them there. And it's a bit of a misnomer. So let's take a trip down memory lane. Uh, when we first started using DataGuard, in fact, even before DataGuard came along, people were doing their own, what I call homegrown standbys, uh, way back as far as Oracle 6 and 7, which was, you would manually copy the archive logs over to somewhere and do a recovery of a database. And that was how you keep a DR site active. So this is what we used to do. One moment. So this is what we used to do. We would have a primary and we would have a standby and the primary would have redo logs that would slowly fill. So they would slowly fill up and once they were full, they would be archived. And then we would copy those full archives over to the standby. Even the early iterations of DataGuard did this. Now, before you take me to task on my diagram, I know we have redo and we have archive redo and they're separate things, but I'm keeping the diagram simple here because it's PowerPoint, it's hard to do. So I'm assuming here our redo is filled, they become archived redo on the primary. And what we used to do is then those full archives would be then sent over to the standby. The problem was, if you had a half full redo log, therefore your current redo log, and you had a catastrophe, that's how much data you lost. And as a result, people started coming up with interesting ways of working around this. They would have very, very small redo logs, but then that would get them into checkpoint problems. Or they would do things like set archive lag targets, such that the most they would lose is 600 seconds, because every 600 seconds, even if a redo wasn't full, it would switch to a new one and archive it off. All those really were sort of just damage limitation exercises. We fixed that with the concept of standby redo logs. They are not, as the name suggests, redo logs that will become active when your standby becomes active. They're not for that purpose. Standby redo logs are actually for keeping that data loss to zero because we want to apply our redo in near real time. What happens is, for each redo log, you have a standby redo log, and as changes occur in your primary redo, they are literally sent over to an equivalent or partnering redo log over on the standby. That's why they need to be the exact same size. They are effectively a, um, a symbiotic relationship between the primary redo and the standby. As redo occurs, the RFS process is sending that over to the standby. I say the term partners, and a lot of people had this misconception that that's why if you have five redos, you're meant to have five, in fact, six standby redos, because people think they're all lined up one to one. That's not actually the case. We don't do that. The standby redos are there simply as a accept redo and apply it to my standby. So because that's really all your standby is typically doing, often if it's not in, in active data guard mode, then that can be very, very efficient. So redo number one will be sending over to redo, standby redo number one. When redo number one fills up and standby redo number two starts working, if standby redo number one is not currently being used to apply redo, it'll be used as well. And same, even primary redo three. Oh, hang the table. So even primary redo three, if standby redo number one is not actively being used for recovery, it will simply all go to there. So it's one of those weird things. If you go look at some of the database stats, the V dollar views, it sort of says that the only redo log ever being used is standby 
redo number one. That's because your system there isn't that busy. The reason you have to, or we recommend that you have more as at least one more than redos, is if your machine is really being belted, RFS may be wanting to send information from all your redos on your primary, that's the worst case scenario, and therefore it needs a standby redo in which to actually funnel those changes into. But typically, on most systems, if they're running just moderately busy, you'll only see standby router number one in active use. This is how we add them. It's really just a normal auto database command, but you add the standby clause to make sure you actually have standby redos as well. They are a brand new redo log group. So some of the common gotchas, the common mistakes that people make is one, they don't have them at all because we don't, we don't fail or anything. All we do is we simply say this, there's nothing there. In fact, it'll, I didn't put it in. We'll simply say this, you have no entries in your V dollar standby log. DataGuard won't fail. It simply goes back to the old behavior. When a redo fills up, then we'll apply the archived redo, thus opening you up for data loss. Another common gotcha is if people are running rack systems, they'll add standby redos and they'll nominate a thread number. And one of the cool things, as I said, because we don't have to have that exact matching between redos and standby redos, we simply use them as demand re requires, you can create your standby redos with thread zero, which means any of the redo threads on your primary rack system can take advantage of it. But if you do nominate a thread, then only primary redo from that thread will be able to use it. And so sometimes you end up with these kind of things where in your alert log it says, I was trying to do some work with redo thread two from another instance, and I couldn't find a thread two equivalent in standby redo. And that's when things get really messy because some redo threads do have them, some don't, and you can get into all sorts of mess. So make sure you have lots of standby redo logs, more than your redo logs, thread zero, such that anything that use them, and you are almost totally insulated then against data loss due to archived redo. Very cool. Oh, the last final gotcha. I should say, is your control file has a cap on how many log files you're allowed to have. And once you get into the concept of adding lots of standby ready log files, then you may need to recreate your control file to actually um, accommodate that many standby read logs. Uh, I think we default to 16. But yeah, so standby ready logs, mitigation against data loss, and it really makes it just a really super duper piece of technology now because you get these incredibly low potential of data loss. And with some of the graceful failover stuff, you know, it almost doubles as a really cool clustering solution. I promised I would tell you a funny story uh, before we go about the hospital. As I said, my son went into our hospital for a knee operation and uh, I stayed the night with him just to look after him. He's only 13. And so I was in a little fold up bed in there and during the night, he got up to go to the toilet as, as requested by the nurse after an anesthetic. You uh, need to make sure that you can um, uh, go to the loo, otherwise it might be indicative of something else. He got up, did his business. As he was coming back, he slipped and knocked a glass of water over onto the floor. I didn't know this. So I jumped up out of my little portable bed that they'd put aside to me to uh, assist him. Didn't see the water, slip over, and I'll, I'll lean in. You might be able to see still a bit of a, a lump there. Bang my head on the wrought iron corner of the bed, knock myself out for two minutes. I come to, my, my poor son's been abandoned. He's just in his, uh, in his bed. I'm on the floor. There's a million doctors and nurses all over me. I'm covered in patches for ECG and stuff like that. And uh, funnily enough, they go, is there any, any issues of heart disease in the family? Which there isn't. And I should have just kept my mouth shut there, but of course I go, I go, no, no, I, my mother has a pacemaker. Oh, suddenly there, there's 10 more doctors who are like, get the cardiac unit in here, quick, quick. You know, like, oh, it's ridiculous. So I recommend uh, if you go to hospital just to go visit someone else, try not to knock yourself out. Uh, it creates a lot of consternation um, amongst the, um, the hospital staff. Well enough, uh, if there's any American friends on the call, I had a couple of American friends. The first thing they said was, oh, are you going to sue them? It's like, no, it's just one of those things. But a little bit of humor there to finish off the, uh, the hour. Uh, I promise I'll get to the next batch of things uh, in the next office hours. Thank you very much for your attendance. 
obviously I haven't been visiting the chat line too much. I'll go through it and check the Q&A as well. And um, I'll answer all those via a blog post or similar. Uh, but for the time being, once again, as always, thank you so much for attending. I hope you haven't got virtual meeting burnout. And uh, I'll see you next month for another Office Hours. Bye for now, everyone.